Well, it's time now to review the sport of golf in 2022, and it's been, uh, well, I suppose an extraordinary year. Whether it's been a a memorable year is another matter. I think, uh, above all else, the dominant story of 2022 has been the arrival of uh, Live Golf and the divisive effect it's had on the traditional game, uh, with up to 48 players uh, having walked away from various other tours, a lot of them from the US PGA Tour and others from the DP Tour and it doesn't seem as if a resolution between these two warring factions is anywhere close at hand. Anyway, to look at that and some actual golf, I'm joined now by uh, John Lister, former New Zealand professional who's pretty familiar with um, the world scene, having played in many parts of the world, including Europe and the US PGA. John, always nice to talk to you. Good to catch up with you again. So am I right? Liv was the biggest story in golf this year. I think probably um, it certainly is gained a lot of attention, Um, but where it will go, who knows? Yes, that's the problem, isn't it? I mean, they do seem to be very much uh, at loggerheads, don't they? I mean, there's McElroy and Tiger Woods in recent weeks basically stating, well, they did state publicly that Greg Norman's got to go and, and that the negotiations can't or won't take place really while he's still in the driving seat for Live Golf. So that indicates how deep the feelings of animosity are between a lot of these people who previously were all good mates, weren't they, some of them? Yeah, uh, uh, undoubtedly. Um, And look, I'm not quite sure what the um, problem is with Greg, why he is so anti the PGA Tour that's... It's like it's a vendetta against him. He tried again uh, this stuff back in the 90s uh, to set up a rival tour uh, that never got off the ground. <clears throat> and now he's come back with this uh, sortie backed um, live golf. Um, just from my point of view, looking at, at it from obviously the outside, um, uh, Obviously, the Saudis have a lot of money, but they can't keep losing money, which this uh, venture is doing and doesn't look like it's going to be able to turn it around because uh, they don't have a television contract. Uh, They've paid (laughs) billions of dollars to the players. Uh, Some of the biggest names who, who aren't performing. Uh, like Mickelson, I don't think Mickelson's broken past since he's joined them. <laughs> yes, that's right. He's, a, uh, he picked, he's picked up a hundred million dollars for playing some very ordinary golf. But uh, I don't know whether yes. I don't know whether money is such an issue for Saudis. I mean, this is just oil revenue that they're tipping into this sport, and they're doing the same with a lot of other sports. There's Formula One motor racing in Saudi Arabia now, World Heavyweight Boxing Championship fights in Saudi Arabia. Uh, they have a, a tournament or have had tournaments, a part of the DP World Tour. So uh, this is where my sort of kind of cynical view comes in, that what they're doing is they are, to use this new term, they are a sport cleansing. They're using sport to cleanse yes. their own very poor reputation globally, particularly for the human rights abuses and the execution of that journalist, uh, uh, the Saudi journalist who was chopped up into little bits and pieces yep. in the embassy in Turkey. And so their worldwide reputation is at an all-time low. And I think they're trying to claw back some credibility through sport. Um, and unfortunately, it's having a divisive effect on golf. I mean, as far as the PGA Tour is concerned, um, I, I find now that it's hard for me to get really involved in watching a lot of these PGA Tour events because there's an absence of big names. Uh, yeah, to some extent. Um, but you take the likes of uh, Scotty Scheffler, who started the year uh, this year uh, like a house on fire, and then the achievements of Rory McIlroy at the end of the year, winning both the uh, FedEx Cup and the DP World Tour, uh, which is just phenomenal to me um, that one player can do that. And Scotty Scheffler was virtually unbeatable at the beginning of the year. So, uh, uh, look, I don't know. Um, yeah, look, I take the, your point the there. I mean. Thing, 
Uh, I take your point there for sure. Um, but these guys aren't playing uh, every week. And I think this is one of the things that the PGA Tour have addressed, haven't they? They've upped the prize money in a lot of uh, events for this uh, coming year, to 2023. And uh, I think these players now, the McElroys and the Thomases and the Schefflers and the Rams, are going to have to play in a few more tournaments than they ideally probably would like to play under normal circumstances. Well, I've committed to play in all these uh, uh, enhanced tournaments, which I think, including the majors, total about 20, whereas previously they had to commit mm. to 15. So the, they're increasing their schedule. But the... just going back to live for a second, um, Australia are going to have a tournament in February in, in Adelaide, and it's going to be a huge uh, event for them. Uh, Australia hasn't, uh, since the 80s, hasn't really seen the top uh, rated players in the world. They used to see them regularly. Uh, this live golf is one chance for them to uh, see top uh, name players. But the, the problem that live has, and it's not being resolved at the moment, is that the players don't get world ranking mm, points. Mm, it's a big issue for them. So in another year's time, uh, very few of their players are going to be eligible to play in any of the majors because their world ranking points won't be high enough. Mm. That's uh, 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 defending champions, ex champions. Yes, I'll get in the. I'm a bit. I'm a, majors. I'm a, in two minds a bit yeah. about this. I mean, uh, uh, there is, I think, uh, 21 different golf tours uh, around the world. Some of them are very small. Some of them, of course, are very big, as we know. Uh, but uh, all of them, even the New Zealand Open, if you play in the New Zealand Open, uh, you can yes. get world world ranking points. So it seems a bit short sighted and mean-spirited to say this live tour which has maybe 10 or 15 of the world's top 50 players or top 100 players um you can't get any world ranking points from a tournament of that stature well i think the the major sticking point is that they live golf has only played over three rounds it's not uh, yeah that's one factor not four rounds um, yeah and you could argue also, I suppose, that they only have 48 in the field. But what last week we had an PG, we had a PGA Tour event, this Hero Challenge, I think it's called, Tigers Tournament, yeah. and it has about 20 players, but it gets world ranking points. Yeah. So when it yes, suits yeah. the when it suits the US PGA um, or the official World Golf Ranking Company that organises and manages this comp uh, the, the points, uh, they can dish out world ranking points when Tiger wants them for his <laughs> tiny little tournament, but not for Greg Norman's tournament. Yeah, uh, and and look, that's the problem that Liv has got, and until that's solved. I, I just don't see live really going anywhere. Mm. Anyway, let's let's talk some golf. Let's begin with uh, the New Zealanders. Yep. Three names stand out. Of course, Steve Elka, who had another marvellous season on the uh, Seniors Tour. Uh, Ryan Fox, who's come from nowhere and galloped up the world rankings now comfortably inside the top 15. Looks like he'll play in most, if not all, of the majors next year. And Lydia Ko, back to number one in the world. Remarkable achievement, isn't it, for to have a country the size of New Zealand with those three players and their records all in the same year? I, I just, it, to me, it is astonishing that a little old New Zealand we can have Steve Elka dominate the senior or champions to Lydia dominate the ladies to and Foxy <laughs> the second in the DP World Tour. I mean, it is an achievement that we will never, ever come close to doing again, I would imagine. OK, let, let's start with uh, Lydia. I think a lot of us, and certainly I would confess to this, that maybe a year, 18 months ago, uh, I, I thought that um, she was so far back in the world ranking, she was missing a lot of cuts or a lot more than she's ever missed. And um, she, her driving, her putting, everything seemed to be off and she seemed to be just treading water at best. What turned things around for her? Why did she suddenly come from 55 in the world to number one in the world in the space of about 18 months? Yeah, I think uh, Sean Foley is the answer to that. 
Uh, well, partly. Uh, the other part of it is Lydia herself, because champions find a way to succeed. But Sean Foley got her to believe in herself again. She'd had so many changes of equipment, of coaches and lifestyle and everything that I really think she got a bit lost. And one of my own theories, I have no proof of it, but she studied psychology at the University of Seoul. Uh, and maybe she started to psychoanalyze herself. And uh, that would be a major problem for a golfer, I would imagine. The other thing that she's addressed, that when she was at a low ebb, uh, she's never been a long hitter of the golf ball, and we have seen this growth uh, from a number of players coming through the ranks of women's golf, now able to hit the ball out to 280, 290, 300 yards. Um, okay, yeah. not as far as the men, but far, far, going the, the ball going a lot more further off the tee than has traditionally been the case and she was I think 150th a year or so ago in driving and I think she still might be somewhere around about just inside the top 100 but she's also added length hasn't she to her um, driving off the yes. tee yeah uh, she's an athlete and um, if you go back to when she first was number one in the world she was quite a lot more chubby than what she is now um, so I think uh, athletically She's better suited now to uh, having a more live swing, if you like, and generate the power. But the other thing that is truly remarkable is that the ladies on the LPGA Tour are so much better today than what they were when she first became mm, exactly. world number one. There's a lot so more depth. Yeah. Her achievement is even bigger than mm just getting back to being number one. And then there's her putting. I heard one of the American commentators say, I think it might have been in that uh, final event, the championship season final, that she might be the best putter in golf, male or female. Would you go that far? Uh, no, I wouldn't. <laughs> um, uh, look, I, I always, even though her figures say that she is one of the very, very best, uh, it's only in this last year that I think Lydia has really started to feel comfortable in reading greens. Uh, it's always been a long um, uh, weakness to me uh, that her speed of the putts and different things were never quite where they should be, but this year she's been fantastic. Mm. But... Um, Going back to your question about the best of uh, in the world, uh, you have a look at Scotty Scheffler. I mean, man, he just holds mm. punts from everywhere all day long. Yeah, but she seems to have more days on than off. I mean, same with Rory McIlroy. When he's got his putter w working, he's, to me, f by far and away the best golfer in the world. Lee at his length off the tee, his consistency off the tee, and days when his putter's hot and boy. Um, even Tiger at his best, I think, would have to pull out something to stay with him. So, and But Lydia, uh, Lydia, Lydia, I agree. But Lydia seems to have a lot I, of days like that, doesn't she? More so than most golfers. Yeah, and she, she is a fantastic putter. But she's also a fantastic player from tee to green. Mm. And uh, what happens in the modern day is there are so many stats that um, you start to pick on things that really aren't a problem <laughs> and say that they're a weakness because mm. they happen to be the weakest in her her repertoire. But they're still strengths for anybody else. Okay. To Ryan Fox, who's come from nowhere in the world rankings this year uh, and pulled himself up. I th think he's in 29th place at the moment. He's been as high as 23. He'll certainly play in the Masters next year, and we spoke to him yesterday, and he's confident, hopefully, that he can at least get in one other major, even if he, even if his ranking falls back. If I think if he's inside the top 100, he gets into one of the other ones, and he's got a guarantee, I think, also for the British Open Open Championship because of his yeah. uh, standing on the DP Tour. Um What's the big difference in his game that you see, see this year? Oh, I think, uh, again, it's uh, the putting. Um, he's, he's gone to the up the left arm uh, arm lock putting. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ryan has held more putts this year than he's 
hold probably in the last five years. Uh, and so I think that's the major difference. And what it does is increase the confidence and his confidence is sky high and it's just fun to see and he plays an exciting brand of golf. Mm. It's you, great to watch. Uh, once asked, or not so long ago, uh, his coach here in, in New Zealand, Marcus Wheelhouse, uh, if he ever tries to change uh, Foxy's attitude off the tee because he uh, hits the ball a long way, but he misses quite a few fairways as well. And Marcus said, "No, no, it's I let him go. Whatever he wants to do off the tee, he can do." And when I was talking to him about yeah. it yesterday, he made a very good point, which I've heard before. This bomb and gouge mentality. He said he would sooner miss the fairway and have a wedge out of the rough than be back a further fifty yards and playing a seven iron into the green. Interesting, isn't it, how the game has changed? Would that thinking have prevailed in your day? No, because <laughs> we didn't hit it the distances that they do today. Um, yes, I was a long hitter in my day, but um, I couldn't get down there where um, coming out of the rough with a wedge was better than um, playing out of the fairway with a seven iron. Mm. Uh, whether the rough is less uh, height today that they can control the ball better with their wedge than what we could out of the rough, I don't know. But mm. um, certainly um, being on the fairway was uh, <laughs> number one thing. And Steve Elker, one of the really nice guys, uh, always been a gentleman, yeah. is a perfect person you know, from the media's point of view because he's always available, always happy to talk. And uh, he's struggled for years on that uh, US PGA Tour or Tours, uh, the main tour, and even the Corn Ferry Tour. You've played a bit on the Seniors Tour a few years ago. Put into some kind of perspective what he's done this year. It's just absolutely phenomenal. And it, as you say, it couldn't have happened to a nicer person. And I'm just thrilled for him. Uh, but, I mean, the guys that he's playing against are world stars of yesteryear that can still really play good golf, and he's just brained them. I mean, hes it's not just uh, that he's had the odd win. He's just been in the top five every week, mm. almost. Just as they say, <laughs> coining it. And uh, final word here on Rory McIlroy, as much as I've loved seeing Lydia Ko recapture her form and take her to the number one position in the world, um, and Rory, in a kind of way, is sort of parallel that, isn't he? He came onto the scene, won four majors in his early by his early 20s, then went into a bit of a funk for a number of years. Um, he's back. He still hasn't won another major, I think, for the best part of about eight years. Years, have a feeling that it might come in 2023, at least one. What do you make of his golf at the moment? Oh, I think he's uh, grown and got better and better through the time. And um, funnily enough, since he's been on the uh, 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 player's representative on the board of the US PGA Tour, uh, he's had a lot to say. And in, in a way, I think it's matured his golf game as well. Mm. Um, he, he feels that he's uh, got to walk the walk as well as talk the talk. Mm. Mm. Yes, and he'll be looking forward for that uh, elusive fifth major next year in 2023, along with Lydia, who also hasn't won a major for a number of years and will be keen. I think that's probably the thing now driving Lydia more than anything. And McElroy, I think, John, isn't it? The majors will be their priority. And, and I think with Lydia, she's only two points away from uh, qualifying for the uh, Hall of Fame, and I think that will be a major Mm. motivation for her even though she says it's not um, I think it will be and I think uh, with Rory uh, it just astounds me that he hasn't won more majors and yeah, I'm like you uh, uh, the next one is going to be very not very long coming not far away John Lister thank you for your thoughts on the golfing year for 2022 and uh, how's your golf game still hitting a few aren't you out tomorrow aren't you today oh, or tomorrow I, I try and hit a few i Hardly call it playing, but I do enjoy <laughs> myself out there. That's the main thing. Thank you, John. You have a nice Christmas. Yeah. And you too.